conectarse. Este hipo. Solo necesitan conectarse en Zoom y en la parte de interpretación pueden escoger el idioma. Gracias. Good. So now the room is also quiet. So we have um, a lot ahead of us. Um, so um, we want to use this first session this morning mainly to share information on the summits on and processes which are going on um, in uh, next year. So uh, basically starting from the summit of the future, the Beijing plus 30, uh, then um, F the FFD4 conference, obviously also the World Social Summit, the COP uh, or the COPs if you want this year, next year. Um, there are also, um, let me see what, what other processes we have in our plan. We have the work on, on SDGs, we have uh, Yeah, I think that's already quite a lot. Um, so the, the main idea now is really to share information, what is going on, um, how it is going on, also how civil society can be involved. Um, there is probably not much time left then to, to say much about the political implications, but if the speakers want, they, they are also invited, um, which will be interesting. Before... Um, um, We start with uh, Barbara Adams from the Global Policy Forum. And um, instead of giving an overview, we decided actually it's interesting to see from the Pack for the Future process how this developed. Um, and I think it, that might be a really interesting learning for the future processes. So, um, yeah, we will, I think by now uh, you know about the different. Uh, summits and so on, we will hear more about that. Um, but I think we, we uh, I'm looking forward for this insight into the Pack for the Future process. Thank you very much, Ingo. And let me apologize immediately that I'm, I'm supposed to be somewhere else right now. Um, so I won't really have time to give context um, and really not take comments or questions. So an um, enormous apologies for that. I think you knew, but we're... And so the other thing I want to just say, I'm going to show you some very few examples from the process that led to the negotiations and the outcome of the Pact for the Future. I've chosen a couple of articles that definitely affect... I know the commitment that many people have around Agenda 2030, but need to emphasize to you that the Pact of the Future is not about 2030. The Pact is about the failure of global governance and the need to reform global governance across all areas. So in addition to sustainable development and rights, we have the Security Council, Peace and Security. We have what's happening in the digital world And we also have Declaration of Future Generations. So my examples will not look at those, okay? But I really need to emphasize that to look at this in that whole. Um, I'm picking on a couple of, well, picking on, that's the wrong word. So what you can see here, I hope you can, it's a bit bright, so I hope that works. Um, I don't know how many of you followed what was happening. The negotiations amongst the governments went through many revisions. Here you've got Rev 1, Rev 2, before Rev 1 there was a zero draft and there was also a so-called compilation text. And so then we had Rev 1, Rev 2, Rev 3, Rev 4, Rev 5 and what was finally adopted a couple of days ago. Now this is, no I just said I haven't included the zero. The zero draft is really irrelevant. I haven't got time to explain. It's just a way of finding something that all member states will be prepared to use to talk to each other. And then it changes dramatically. So the reason that I'm, and you'll see that there are just a couple of things. So in Rev 1, frankly, was a big surprise. We had a compilation text of over 200 pages. The co-facilitators brought forward with first revision, which was 20 some pages. Um, and it was pretty, at that stage in negotiations and for what was going on, was pretty ambitious, frankly. And we have seen deterioration ever since. Okay, so, so here you will see that on action, whoops, 45, 
we will reform the international, reform the international financial architecture to enable countries to borrow with confidence, code language for saying it wasn't imposed on them, promote access to affordable credit, not the high interest rates that they are being confronted with right now, prevent unsustainable borrowing, which is huge, because basically, if your only option is unsustainable borrowing and there are no decent rules on the lenders, for them to also be accountable for not pushing unsustainable loans, because they like them, because then you have to pay interest forever. I think we sort of know what that means. And facilitate timely, coordinated, and fair debt restructuring. These are all key things that we've been work working in the UN around for ages. So what happened? So it became Rev2. We accelerate the reform of the international financial architecture to ensure that countries can borrow sustainably to invest in their long-term development. All of the stuff to invest in their long-term development, not for them to decide what they need investment for, not with regard to public health, not with regard to dealing with climate, et cetera. Then we've got the language, we will accelerate the reform, et cetera, et cetera. So despite a huge amount of effort to get back to something more ambitious, we ended up with a sort of, you know, you can see what's adopted. We will accelerate the reform of international financial architecture, so et cetera. Okay, next example. We will accelerate the reform of international financial architecture so that countries can borrow sustainably to invest in their long-term development. We just looked at that. Um, I don't know how many of you follow this. One of the key things around development and the borrowing for developing countries is the fact that their credibility on financial markets is determined by credit rating agencies. There are three credit rating agencies that dominate this, and they are all juristide, juristide I just made that up, hmm, in the US, okay? Here's the language. So we had request the Secretary General to engage with credit rating agencies to agree actions that enable access to resources and enhance ratings contributions to achieve the SDGs. In other words, you don't just rate them according to a corporate level profit line in anything. Could be anything. Could be AI. Could be military. No. Okay? Because when you're looking at whether you're going to invest in a country, you just want to know whether your money's going to get lost or not. So then it became requesting to, with credit rate, to explore options. Options start coming in. Options. The moment you get in language at the UN to explore options, that always means that it's not a commitment. I mean, that's right. And then you start to put other things on the agenda to either slow the process down or stop the process. Okay. To explore options to improving developing country access to credit, nothing to do with how's that going to work. Okay, and I'm, I can't, I don't have time to go through all of these, but I will share the PowerPoint if you want it with people so that you can see. Welcome the Secretary, I'm, I'm now in Rev 3. Welcome the Secretary General's efforts. Just use your imagination of what kinds of conversations are going on in closed meetings amongst member states with very, very different positions on this issue. Some know we, you're not going to be involved in credit rating agencies. That belongs over here. Others that are saying this is the root cause of our problem and we need change. I mean, and then just think about how and what goes on. Secretary General's efforts to engage with credit rating agencies in, in their role, credit rating agencies, in their role on sustainable development and request the Secretary General keep member states updated on these discussions. Oh, we're having a good time. Oh, we're having a bad time. I mean, so Rev4, take note. We're no longer welcoming. Those of you who follow UN language, you've got to look at these verbs. The verb endorse something is completely different from take note, means, oh, okay, you did it and we're not going to act on it. Okay. So just to say, I'm going to jump to the next one because I also need to jump. <laughs> uh, action four. Sustainable Development Goal Financing Gap in Developing Countries. Rev 1. Explore options. 
for a global minimal level of taxation on high net worth individuals at the fourth conference on financing for development. Okay? So there's been a lot of conversation. This is already Couple of other things here. This is the action. This is as it finally came out. We will accelerate reform of the international financial architecture to just blah, blah, blah. Okay, the reform of international financial architecture should place the 2030 agenda at its center with an unwavering commitment to invest in. This is the preambula. Now, we continue to pursue deeper reforms of international continue to pursue the reforms we've got already after we've just kicked the UN and global economic governance out of the story. I'm sorry, I know, I hope you've got a really good time for the rest of the day because I know I'm being no help whatsoever. So, um, 76, it's more of the same. The United Nations and, are you ready for this? This is in what has been adopted. The United Nations and international financial institutions have complementary mandates. The UN has no jurisdiction. Our human rights work, our environmental treaties. We can coordinate as this expresses, but there's no accountability of these complementary institutions, mandates, and institutions to be held accountable to these standards. So I'm not going to read all of this because now down, go down the bottom, last one, we welcome steps to improve the voice and representation because you know that the governance of the International Monetary Fund is one dollar, one vote, right? It's not one country, one vote. It's a shareholder based area. And there's what I call a veto in its governance because there you have to get uh, more than 85% uh, vote to be able to do it. They do it mainly by consensus. I can speak louder. Oh, I can even stand up and yell. But then I can't read my screen. That's really complicated. Okay. Um, so what I... Sorry about that. Um, and so... Basically, that means that there isn't, at the moment, on the current configuration of the executive board there, there isn't a representation of any country from sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, and of course, this harks back to what we know, that the current governance of the Security Council and the Bretton Woods institutions, which are basically the International Monetary Fund, on the one hand and the World Bank on the other, were put in place before when only 51 countries in the world were independent, politically independent, and there was never and there has never been a representative because 
the seats are allocated according to how many dollars, according to the shareholder approach. And we've been campaigning for ages that this is unjust. And how can we be surprised that we don't get quality outcomes through these processes when the actual decision-making process itself is so biased? So here, this is beginning to get through, except what have we got here? The creation of a 25th chair of on the International Monetary Fund Executive Board for Sub-Sahara Africa. They've all got to work together, et cetera. And recent changes to quotas and voting power. Okay, so what's, what, what have we just agreed to? Ah, oh, we'll give the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa one out, one out of 25 seats at the International Monetary Fund. And we've agreed, if you go back to the first one, that actually the mandates are only complementary. And so all of the things that we are doing on SDGs and human rights and so on, it would be nice if they took it into consideration. I really need to leave you because I think you don't like anything I'm saying. Um, and I also need to leave you for other reasons because I'm already in deep trouble with where I should be. There are a couple more slides here and I want to just point this out. We've done a report with perspectives from the Global South, which includes quite a lot of what I've made reference to, but it's broader. It also includes the reform of the Security Council. It also looks at how we need to get rid of GDP. I, have, I can't go into... ah. GDP is in the pact. After decades, we've actually got, yes, maybe it's not quite good enough and we might need to make the measurement of progress something different. So, and that's that. Oh, and that's that. Okay. Oh, Julie put this here. She's brilliant. Okay. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, so, um, if you want more, you've, you told me you read it. If you want more of this depressing stuff, it's not depressing. It really isn't. When we know what we're up against, We've got agency and we've got influence, okay? And I think that we need to also make sure next time with the processes you're going to be talking about going forward, you know, the instructions, it's not all decided here. The instructions are made at the capitals. The instructions on these issues come from the capitals. If, you, if we look at this stuff early enough before they start their Rev 1s and we require accountability, and we make sure that in the parliamentary or whatever, the, not the executive branch, the parliamentary or whatever parliamentary equivalent process takes place, hears us and reports, that's where we can hold them accountable. That's where we have agency as well. So don't be depressed. Just don't stop working. Thank you very much, Barbara. It was really, as usual, very interesting. And I, I appreciate the analysis of the Global Policy Forum in general. And so your new status, your reports are very helpful. Um, and I think this will be helpful also for, the, for this session. So uh, thanks for coming. And don't worry, you have to leave. Uh, yeah, OK. So we have now uh, different people, and the order is not fully uh, according to any um, logic, but as we know, all the different points belong to uh, each other. The, um, so we will start um, with uh, Beijing plus 20, uh, so 30, not 20, Beijing plus 30. So um, we will yeah, hear from Rebe Rebecca Heuvelsmans, I don't know. <laughs> uh, from Women Engage for a Common Future about Beijing plus 30. Yes, thank you. I'll actually go stand up there because my laptop has unfortunately died. So I'm going to use these slides. All right. Okay, thank you all for having me. My name is Rebecca Heuvelmans and I work for Women Engage for a Common Future. And I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the upcoming Beijing Plus 30 process and also give a little bit of the history of it so you all feel quite comfortable when you see this term up next. So starting from the beginning, what is the Beijing Platform 
So it's a comprehensive policy agenda for women's rights that was adopted in 1995 by 189 countries at the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, right? Hence the name. So it consists of 12 different action areas. So the girl child, environment, institutional mechanisms, economy, violence against women, which is what VAW stands for, human rights, health, women in power, media, armed conflict, education, and Harvard. So let's have a little look back um, closer to Beijing plus 25. So every five years, there is a review. Um, and we're going to look at the Gender Equality Forum, which was a quite crucial multi-stakeholder gathering in the context of the 25th anniversary of Beijing. And it had two major meetings. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, we have two major uh, meetings uh, back in Mexico is more of a preparatory meeting and then in Paris where the action coalitions were first launched. Ah, okay. Um, the action coalitions uh, consist of a wide variety of stakeholders. So it includes member states, women's movements, civil society organizations and private sector, as well as UN agencies and other international organizations and youth leaders play a crucial part in these action coalitions. So there are six of them. These are the ones, I'll read them out. Uh, one on gender-based violence, economic justice and rights, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, feminist action for climate justice, technology and innovation for gender equality, a feminist movements and leadership. So now looking ahead, what is Beijing plus 30? So it's a 30-year review of the Beijing Declaration and the Platform of Action. And it's a really important check-in point where we also have the opportunity to discuss um, what the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action mean towards the realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So there are different steps to this process. So firstly, national governments are asked to do a review of their implementation the Beijing Platform of Action. So looking at trends, achievements, remaining gaps and challenges that they have, but also look ahead at the future. Um, then there are regional meetings that are coming up quite soon. So for the different regions, um, there will be regional meetings. So for example, for the UNEC region, to which uh, our organization belongs, that is coming up in October. Um, and I would highly recommend that you also engage with those that are also following the processes on the sidelines. So for example, I know that for the African region, Femnet is doing a lot of work for Asia and the Pacific. Please get in touch with organizations such as APWLD. So there are tons of ways to get engaged also at these regional processes. Uh, and all of this then feeds into the global synthesis report, which will be submitted to the Commission on the Status of Women 69 in March. And why is this again such a crucial time to be talking about these topics. These are just a couple of <laughs> depressing statistics again for you this morning, I apologize. So not one country is on track to achieve gender equality by 2030. Nearly 40% of countries have stagnated or even declined between 2019 and 2022. And this one is particularly staggering, 74% of the SDG targets won't be achieved without gender equality. So in all of your work on all of the different topics that I'm sure that you all work on, they cannot be achieved without having gender equality at the center. And therefore the review Beijing plus 30 is a crucial moment that we should all be engaging in. Oh, I'll, I clicked it away. I apologize if that is wrong. <laughs> And um, I just wanted to flag this little document again. So um, I introduced that yesterday as well during the Feminist Fishbowl. We have a briefing note on different policy processes that are particularly linked to gender, climate, and the summit of the future. So for a lot of these upcoming conferences that you'll also be hearing about in this session, there's this handy one pager with a couple of links that are uh, crucial that explain the link between these different topics uh, and just serve as a nice little, I don't know, in Dutch, you would say speak briefly, like a cheating note that you can always have on hand uh, to make sure that you know what all of these different abbreviations mean. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Can you say maybe one or two words about how people can engage from civil society? Yeah, sure. 
Um, so uh, there are different ways to engage. So what has already passed for most of us are the national reviews. So also governments are, um, yeah, encouraged to also engage with civil society for these national reviews. And then for the regional uh, meetings, there are a ton of ways, like I said, that you can engage as civil society. So make sure that you look up which region, you know, you belong to, and then you can um, get in touch with the focal points that are organizing the NGO uh, meetings on the sidelines of these uh, of these conferences. Um, and then, of course, also at the uh, Beijing Plus 30 itself, make sure that you engage with for example, groups like the Women's Rights Caucus, for example, that have been following these processes for ages and ages. And that was also something that came out of the Feminist Fishbowl session uh, yesterday, that intergenerational dialogues are crucial when it comes to these topics. So also make sure that you get in touch with those that have been following the processes longer, longer than I have as well. Uh, and I know there's a ton of experience when I'm looking around the room here as well. So um, yeah. Get chatting, see who is going to Beijing Plus 30, make sure you also individually connect and make sure that you engage in your regional processes. Thank you. One very quick, yeah. Thanks so much, that was great. Uh, how open are these conferences to civil society? How important is it for us to be there physically? And because uh, I, in the UNEC region, there's one happening in October. Should we all try and get there? Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? And what about uh, CSW69? Should we all be coming or not? Thank you. Um, I would say that um, it is, of course, always crucial to be there physically. Um, it is very important that we make sure that there is a progressive noise happening at these uh, at these meetings. In terms of at least how open they are or how easy it is to engage, um, CSW conferences, for example, are generally always closed, right? So um, you don't have the chance to go sit in a room and listen to the negotiations. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not important to be there on the sidelines to make sure that you're talking to governments, making sure that the priorities that we have gathered as civil society still reach them also there on the grounds. Uh, but it is, of course, also a very it's a position of luxury to be able to talk like that because I know it's not um, possible for everybody to engage, to get on an expensive flight yet again to New York, um, get a visa. So there are a lot of restrictions for civil society to engage. Um, but if you do have the opportunity to and you... Um, yeah, yeah, you have you have that privilege also to be able to stand up for our common rights. Um, I would highly recommend that you do so. Yeah. Okay, so... This is a very important process and now we come to the next and we will see how to connect also um, in the afternoon. The financing for development uh, for conference will uh, happen next year in Sevilla in Spain uh, from end of June to beginning of July. And uh, I'm happy we have here Vitalis Meja from the civil society FFD mechanism um, they are coordinating the civil society work, also as part of the major groups and, and other stakeholders. So, Vitalis, please tell us how, yeah, about the conference and how to engage. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting us. Um, um, as we had yesterday, the the fourth conference will take place in Seville, um, and in terms of how we engage, there are various sessions that are planned including preparatory meetings and uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue. So the, f the first preparatory meeting already took place in uh, July. Uh, the next one will be, the next event is a multi-stakeholder dialogue that will take place here in October uh, 28th, where civil society and other groupings will be invited to give ideas or inputs into uh, the agenda um, and then, of course, the, um, the second uh, preparatory meeting will take place in December, again here in New York. Uh, the third is supposed to, the th third preparatory session is supposed to take place in New York again uh, next year, yeah, sometime in February. And then uh, from there, uh, we now honestly begin to prepare for the conference. Now, right now we are working on ele an elements paper. The elements paper is just to churn out what ideas member states should engage with. 
uh, and uh, that uh, is going to be closed uh, by 24th of October. And so as a work stream, uh, so sorry, so, so that is the official process. Now, as civil society, we have organized ourselves within uh, Financing for Development Civil Society uh, Group. Um, and uh, it's a mechanism. And this mechanism has work streams that uh, it uses to engage within these processes. And the work stream, uh, sorry, the, the mechanism has, these work streams are divided into the following. We have a tax work stream. We have a debt work stream. We have international public finance work stream. We have a work stream on uh, private finance. We have a work stream on trade and we have a work stream on systemic issues. So the way we engage is that each of these work stream uh, um, develops contents or materials that uh, inform civil society positions, okay? Uh, and that these positions are then uh, the, the ones that we use to engage with the UN DESA and the member states. So that's the way we are organized. So if any of us would like to engage, it's really to align, sorry, there's also a work stream on climate finance. I forgot about that. So if you want to engage in any of these uh, work streams, please, we are highly encouraging members to register within those work streams because that is where everything is happening. Okay, and we also want uh, so each work stream has a facilitator or two co facilitators. And I think um, uh, we have the list will be sent around with every lead a facilitator that you can get in touch with so that you can register to engage. For us, as a, a, a mechanism, we are really mobilizing for civil society groups to be part and parcel of this process from the preparatory process up to the actual conference. And we intend to have a, a civil society preparatory meetings uh, when we get to survey. So we really want you to be part and parcel of this agenda. The other element that I want to raise is an element that we talked about yesterday, that this process is not necessarily exclusively a New York process. This process begins from the country level, from the capital. Because this is where the policy gets shaped. This is where the decisions or positions get inf informed and influenced. So we are really encouraging me uh, our members to begin engaging uh, you know, our governments at the capital so that uh, some of the positions that we are developing already inform the discussions that then will translate uh, into positions when we come here. Um, the UN uh, recognizes the mechanism as one of those uh, uh, groups that uh, are engaged to inf inform and influence uh, uh, the process. And we uh, regularly uh, interrelate or engage with them uh, in terms of uh, you know, what civil society feel and how we react. We also have access to outcome documents. And so we're really encouraging that all of us engage within the mechanism uh, to ensure that uh, civil society input, views, and positions uh, are uh, influenced, but also inform some of the discussions that uh, are going to take place between now and uh, uh, civil. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Vitalis. Um, so where's uh, Ishan? Um, so can you uh, can you wait for a few minutes because um, we have uh, Maria Gon Gonzalez here from Futa in Común from Spain, um, which is hosting the FFD4 conference, and we thought it would be good also to hear from her, her about um, plans from civil society in Spain. Yes, yes, yes. So, so uh, different people have to go for to different meetings. So don't worry, that's fine. Uh, we are happy that you that you came, and uh, so thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Ingo. For those who don't know Futuro Común, uh, Futuro Común is a very big alliance of uh, cross sectorial uh, civil society alliance that involves more than fifty. 
IT organizations and sectoral platforms, national platforms, from very different sectors. We have the environment, decent work, trade unions, uh, global justice, social action, peace, migration, childhood or youth. We all join together to work on sustainable development and uh, analysis and proposals. Uh, uh, louder? Okay. Okay, sorry. And also for a transformative implementation of the 2030 agenda in our country, in Spain. And now regarding the FFD conference, we are, uh, well, just to uh, share with you that we are uh, in touch with our government to contribute to the Spanish position uh, at the national level, but uh, also bridging with the global civil society networks to push for an inclusive process. And uh, during the uh, during the preparation, but also uh, during the conference itself, of course, uh, through the official mechanism for civil society participation, but also trying to engage other organizations and platforms that are not so specialized in the issues that are going to be discussed, but uh, to getting engaged around the conference due to its relevance <laughs> and. Um, in both national and global level, our government wants to bring uh, uh, the contributions of the academy to the table uh, and try to build uh, also alliances uh, around the strategic issues, uh, which uh, there is no agreement or even uh, there are polarized polarized positions uh, among the member states. So I think that um, we're, we're We've been talking about this, and maybe the, here there is a good opportunity to get engaged and to uh, contribute to the building of these uh, alliances processes, maybe around debt or taxes or or uh, some other issues. And um, it would be also very useful to provide uh, an input for national positions of, of those states that are aligned and uh, can be allies to get more uh, ambitious agreements. Uh, that could be another way of engagement. And well, at national level, our government, I don't know what your uh, your governments are, are preparing to, to make the processes of building their own position. Uh, but our government is also organizing like multi-stakeholders workshops to, to raise the concerns and demands of civil society, academy, and also private sector. Um, so we are going to be very active in those processes. And of course, we are available uh, to support any mobilization plans. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to regret this, but uh, we are available um, around the conference, both online or offline. Uh, let's see if we how muscle we have to uh, to to uh, to mobilize mobilize people there in Sevilla, but we will try and we'll do our best, and we are available. Uh, my email is Maria uh, Gonzalez .net. Well, sir, Ingo can share with you. Futuro en común, the alliance. Futuro, our common future. It's very simple. <laughs> and I think that would be it. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. I think it's really important to have um, civil society in the host country. And uh, it's also good to hear about mobilization. I know it's a challenge. We will talk about it. Uh, this afternoon uh, in the FFD fourth conference is probably the first bigger moment for mobilization. Um, I understand um, that there will be a civil society forum at the at the conference. Um, yeah, so like in Addis Ababa, uh, I I understand there were like around six seven hundred people, and probably this time it will be bigger. Uh, do you know anything about that already? We asked yesterday to our government, and of course they they say they are going to be very supportive to to guarantee a very inclusive process. Uh, I think that six hundred people is like the the minimum level, but uh, let's see if it is enough. And of course, the the official civil society mechanism is in touch with the government, and they are meeting with them. But we 
as the Spanish Civil Society, of course, are going to support and to put press on that uh, to uh, be so they can facilitate the the visas and all the log logistics, even funding for civil society to participate uh, from global south and uh, of any part of the world. Okay, good. Um, yeah, we are a bit early, but uh, plans are made. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we are now um, jumping, but it's of course there is a, co a connection as we have seen in the presentation from uh, uh, Barbara. So uh, to the Summit of the Future and the Pact for the Future. Um, so we have uh, Ishan Shah here from C4UN. And uh, yeah, what is what is the process? How do, how does it uh, um, what, yeah, what, is, what are the next steps and what are your plans? How can civil society engage? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and apologies. I'm going to be very quick because I do have to, to leave. Um, but probably probably better for you. You don't hear for, uh, from me for very long. Um, but I think on in terms of next steps, I mean, I think implementation just generally within the UN space has been something on our minds for a very long time. Um, I think that people are thinking about implementation of the pact before there even was a pact. Uh, you know, we didn't want this to be another process where the outcomes sort of end up in the UN ether, uh, sort of floating around as some words on paper with no tangible sort of action on the ground. Um, so I think the success of this summit really depends on on its implementation, of course, especially now that the negotiations are wrapped up, that the the gavels hit the whatever the thing's called, um, and um, we we have a pact now to to work with. So I think the implementation piece is really important. I think the first step of that and um, with the the, um, the the way in which groups of people have been analyzing the text and really translating this awkward UN language into activist speak, you know, what does it mean on the ground? What does it mean on a programmatic, on a policy level, at the national level, at the local level? I think that's the first step is translating what this pact actually means in, in practice on the ground. And then rallying uh, around sort of strengthening the monitoring um, mechanisms for this pact, but also getting champion member states on board to start implementing the pact to then inspire other member states to also implement it too. Um, I think that's the, always the hesitancy with implementation is that for us civil society, we're always so bothered with what we're missing and what we're lacking um, that I think we sometimes forget to celebrate the little small wins and the successes because at the end of the day, beyond the words on the paper, um, are, are people's lives, right? That's what it is, the, the essence of this pact. Um, so if it inspires or if it supports a community at the local level, that's a win in itself. Um, you know, we don't need to see, of course, we do need to see global change, but it's those little actions as well that inspire uh, greater action from the ground up. Um, I know that C4UN um, is uh, thinking about their strategy for the next couple of years. As we look ahead, uh, we know that the, ma the pact mandates a follow-up mechanism in 2028 at the 83rd session of the General Assembly. Um, the year before that, 2027, will be the SDG summit. So it's a, sort of a similar um, process. Maybe I should put a trigger warning to, to the past two years that we've just had. The SDG summit plus sort of a summit of the future. We'll have that again, 2027, SDG summit, 2028, follow-up to the summit of the future, the pact itself. So see for UN is, is thinking about what is the, the monitoring mechanism? How can it be uh, sort of made accessible to people as well? How can we have sort of a system that allows monitoring to, to be fun, to be exciting, for accountability to be something that's healthy, not something for the member states to be afraid of? Um, because accountability is good. It's constructive. We need it. Um, and I think the, the other message as well is that, you know, there are already mechanisms across the UN system that need to be strengthened, spe specifically those that are led by CSOs, whether it's the major groups and other stakeholders. And see, Oli is here as well, uh, who is who is our, our lead, our chair, our, our mighty hero uh, within the MGOS. Um, whether it's that, the action coalitions, I'm not sure if Sasha is still around, um, but Sasha has been championing the action coalition work there with the Generation Equality Forums. Uh, so it's about strengthening those existing mechanisms, finding the gaps where those don't exist and, and filling them as well. You know, C4UN and other partners are involved. But I think the main message here is that all of us in this room have put a lot of energy into the process over the past sort of four or five years and, and even more than that. Um, and each of us in this room, I'm sure all of us are very keen on making sure that we implement the pact. Um, so as much as um, you're listening to me, it's more so talking amongst each other and building those partnerships, those connections and those collaborations. And for the C4UN team in the room, if you wave your hands, because I know I have to leave, but, but go and speak to them um, and engage. Uh, we know we're all more than happy to constructively uh, support and engage. Uh, partnerships is the only way that we're going to see success. 
I am so sorry I have to run, but I'll be back later, I hope. So uh, catch me then. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think that uh, was very interesting. And I, I think we are, uh, I probably others are also really looking forward for the for the next steps. Uh, as you said, we have uh, Jeff here, Fergus is here, Dan is here, so probably more. So Rosie is here, yeah. So um, yeah, I hope uh, there will be more inter interaction, of course, afterwards. Thank you for, for coming. And uh, yeah, we understand. <laughs> Good. So uh, maybe we have an. Uh, it's a bit of an information uh, uh, overkill for for all of us, but uh, yeah, uh, I think we can we can digest afterwards. So um, there will be other um, media's to 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 send those um, different information around. So I would like to ask uh, Oli Henman to to come um, as a coordinator of action for sustainable development, also one of the co-chairs of the major groups and other stakeholders. Um, also to to talk about um, this process, the summit of the future, and also to give us some uh, more ideas on the SDG uh, process, uh, what we are all doing since long, but uh, what is what is relevant uh, in in, uh, in the next year, please. Thank you, Ingo, um, and thanks, Ishan, if you're still there for the very kind uh, summary of um, of what I've been helping to do with many of you over recent years. Um, I think it's important uh, when we talk about some of the future just to take a step back. And as we know, many of us have been involved for several years to get to this point. Um, there was a meeting with the co-facilitators from Germany and Namibia at the High Level Political Forum last year, 2023, when we began a lot of the dialogues as far as the uh, established major groups and other stakeholders mechanism to engage in that whole process that Barbara Adams described of the various different iterations, the various different drafts of the pact um, alongside many other civil society partners. And I think it's been really noticeable for a number of reasons. Um, as you know, I mean, we, we have this kind of recognized role as far as the SDGs are concerned. Um, and there are established practices at the UN around how civil society should have the right to be in the room and to be able to make comments and to be able to suggest amendments. Um, and unfortunately, because this process was a broader process and includes a number of different aspects of the UN reform, um, certain member states took that opportunity to say, well, civil society can only be involved up to a certain point. Um, and as you probably know, when the negotiations were happening, we did have many of us in the room in the first few rounds of discussions. But as we got to, I think already at Rev2, and certainly any subsequent revisions have been closed door negotiations. And that has made it very difficult for us as civil society. The only way we've actually been able to see those various revisions that Barbara Adams shared was if a friendly member state was willing to forward it on to us. Um, so there was no um, official way for us to then feed in in those subsequent uh, drafts, although we were, of course, writing to many different member states and we were writing to the co-facilitators. And I think the co-facilitators from Germany and Namibia, they certainly did what they could. Um, potentially, they could have done more. Um, and in fact, yesterday, uh, I was able to talk to the German ambassador who was one of the co-facilitators, and she did say, well, given all of the last minute uh, challenges that they faced with Russia and the fact that that was actually defeated, she said, oh, maybe we should have gone further, actually. So she finally kind of got the message at the end because they were still going to make a problem, whatever, whatever was in the text. So she was actually saying maybe they could have been more ambitious uh, in the end. Um, so we but we are facing concerted resistance by certain member states. Uh, we saw seven of those you know, just uh, yesterday or the day before, trying to block the final version of the pact, Russia, Belarus, Syria, Iran, uh, Venezuela, um, and a couple of others, I can't remember. But so there's a, a very significant, yeah, so there, there are certain groups organizing to specifically block our participation. And also when discussing it with the German ambassador, she, she did say that the last... Um, uh, the last paragraph, which is the one that actually talks about civil society participation. So if you've read the whole text, it's paragraph 83, um, and various sections of that refer to stakeholder participation. 
and she said that those those articles were some of the last ones to be agreed and Russia was still trying to block those right up until this weekend and didn't want those articles in there. Um, so look at 83. Um, what was good from our point of view is it does still recognize relevant stakeholders. It doesn't say major groups and other stakeholders, but it says relevant stakeholders. But the qualifying language that they put in is, it then says, in relevant processes. And so a bit like Barbara Adams was saying before, who decides what's relevant? What does that actually mean? It keeps all the power in the member states' hand to decide when they deem it relevant for stakeholders to be in the room. So this is the kind of challenge that we're up against. Um, on the positives, um, in terms of the, the final text, um, as I said, a couple of days ago in, in one of the um, plenaries, the human rights side, I think, is quite strong. And actually, that was something, again, that many member states did fight for. I know the UK, Canada and others fought to have strong language on human rights and particularly reinforcing the human rights pillar at the UN. So that is uh, a positive. On climate, unfortunately, it falls back on the agreed language of the last COP, which talks about phase down of fossil fuels and unabated coal, but nothing new, uh, unfortunately. So that will be the battle in uh, in, in Baku and, and also Belém in Brazil, I think, was where the most significant move can happen there. Um, and then finally, one of the things that I know David here and various others have been looking at is the localization of funding. And there is a specific article in there that talks about localizing funding by and for and with communities that are most uh, are left behind. So that is potentially a little window that we can build on, that we can then ex expand on in the financing discussions. Um, I do think that going forward, where does the pack go? How is it used? I mean, in, in my mind, I think a large part of the pact has to go into other processes going forward. I mean, we've heard already about the financing that will obviously FFD4 will be where a lot of the detailed discussions on financing happens. And in fact, many member states didn't want very much language in the pact because they feel it should be in the FFD discussion instead. Um, the climate, the COP coming up next year. Um, well, I think the Brazil one will be much more significant than the Baku one. And we're already thinking on how we can mobilize there. Um, Brazil is planning on a big COP in Berlin, in the Amazon, to really bring home the importance of the Amazon. Um, and then, um, I guess, where does that link back to the SDGs? So, so the major groups, as I started at the beginning, the major groups and other stakeholders, main sort of home, if you like, is around the SDGs and the high-level political forum. So I do think that some of the language of the pact also um, potentially gives us further strength to go back at the next HLPF and in the coming years towards the next SDG summit, which was just mentioned by, by Ishan for 2027. Um, and as you might have noticed as well at various points in the discussion, it seems clear that the discussions on what happens after 2030 will only happen from 2027 onwards, from that next SDG summit. So when we get to that next SDG summit, that's when they will start to also think about what happens after 2030. So gives us a few years to make sure we actually get delivery on the current goals um, and make sure that we keep the pressure up. Um, but we're really looking forward to continuing to mobilize with many of you. And I think if you're not involved with the High Level Political Forum yet, get in touch with us. Um, there will be as every year, a number of countries that are doing SDG reviews next year in July, um, and we're really keen to continue to keep bringing the voices of those active in, in each country. And there is always the right, and this is something the UN has been very good on, we always have the right to bring at least one stakeholder from every VNR country to the uh, High Level Political Forum. So if you are involved in that, then uh, also get in touch. But uh, yeah, it's it's a mixed picture, but uh, there's still a lot uh, a lot for us to do going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Ali. Um, a lot to discuss. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, we will see also later. Um, on the on the on you mentioned the the cop um, unfortunately i think if i may ask um, mitika you are not in the room yeah i don't see um is there mitika left uh okay uh, i'm trying to to find someone who can say about the the cop um we will see anyway we are we are running a bit late because of the security in the morning the whole program is a bit uh, like 20 minutes late but uh, I, I think that's fine. So we are coming now to the World Social Summit, which is uh, another uh, main summit um, 
in the UN um, agenda next year. So I'm happy that uh, you got now. Srivas Dava, right, from the organizing partner of the major group of children and youth is here, one of the uh, very active um, networks for the World Social Summit. Thank you very much, Ingo. And sorry, I've lost my voice uh, because of the kind of last few days, how they have been. So um, I just want to well um, go through a couple of things. And of course, I'll be talking about Social Summit and some of these things as well. Um, and just to first uh, of all, build off from what Oli said, right, about NGOs. So there are a couple of things to expand more on that. So on this document that you can see, and this is a document developed by the Major Group for Children and Youth by some of our former focal points and current ones. So this explains you the context and evolution of MGOS system in the UN, right? So when it is started in Agenda 21, how the conventions, the Rio conventions began, um, CSD, process, how the process of major group role extended to SIDS, SCP, FFD, uh, in the functional commissions of ECOSOC, UN Forest, for, Forest Forum, uh, JPOI, which was a very important um, um, element as well, um, and uh, including in UN Energy, and then you look at when you go to Rio Plus 20 and creation of the HLPF itself. Um, some of them are youth centric, but then you would see um, what happened at Rio and then what happened post Rio. So whether that's DRR, Habitat, FFD, humanitarian summit process, um, synergies across the UN system, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to present that and sort of, you know, clarify that major groups, of course, SDGs and sustainable development is a huge part of what major groups do, but then major group system, specifically Agenda 21 major group system is followed across multiple processes. And now if you extend that to how youth engagement is um, done, um, over 50 intergovernmental and 200 multi-stakeholder processes is where we have mapped that there are existing youth engagement uh, constituencies and mechanisms or existing mechanisms and youth constituencies work in those avenues. So that's one thing that I wanted to present you about the scope of work. Um, now, before jumping into the social summit, I also wanted to touch upon some of the youth uh, specific outcomes in the pact. I know we've talked a lot about pact and um, I just wanted to highlight from uh, the perspective of my colleague Same and me, what are some of the um, outcomes that we believe are really um, important when it comes to youth. And it is worth highlighting perhaps that young people have advocated on PACT since the very beginning, since the process for Our Common Agenda report was launched um, that included formation of an Our Common Agenda youth partners group that comprised various constituencies to feed into the Our Common Agenda report, followed by uh, essentially a string of you know activities that young people have done, which you can actually see here. Um, so right from 2020 to 2022, and then moving into you know 2022 to 2024, and it's been over 30, if, if I'm counting and being conservative in counting, consultations, whether those are virtual or on ground that have taken place. And to specify, so when you look at chapter two specifically, we think that the language that came out on how young people should be engaged in the intergovernmental deliberations on peace and security was an important win. This is not something that we have seen generally in other, lang uh, other sort of um, uh, frameworks. However, um, everything else rather in that paragraph on youth was um, from previously agreed language. In chapter four, um, which is you know focused on, you know, which is literally titled Youth and Future Generation, and there are like many interesting takeaways, you can think of there are two specific things that stood out. First is about uh, promoting meaningful and effective engagement in relevant intergovernmental bodies, which kind of is, you can say, a bit generic language, but then also the 37D, which talks about how Secretary General should develop core principles in consultation with member states and young people to um, ensure meaningful representation and engagement across the different processes. In chapter five, um, finally, it was great to see that ECOSOC Youth Forum was recognized in an intergovernmental text, so it says support the youth forum of the council to enhance youth engagement, ensuring that put the platform for youth across all regions to continue and share their ideas with member states. And I think this is something that was framed a little bit differently, but it came out to be this, and we prefer recognizes the youth forum as an important avenue. 
And finally, I just want to quickly mention, as most of you might be aware, that the language on mental health and safeguarding of children and youth in GDC, and my colleague Yash is standing there, was a result of a lot of advocacy from the SPI youth platform, and same for some of the text on the Declaration on Future Generation. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is some priorities. There are many language changes that we have advocated for. In fact, until the very last day, when the silence procedure was underway on Ref 5, MGC had a meeting with Germany and Namibia to discuss what were some of the contentious issues and find solutions to them. So a lot of work has happened in background by youth organizations and just wanted to acknowledge that. Now I'll move to social summit <laughs> very quickly. So um, just to explain about the social summit. So the social summit um, will take place from 4 to 6 November in 2025. And the modalities resolution of the social summit, which lays out what needs to happen and how it should happen. It's not that big. It's like two and a half page document. Um, talks about themes across two roundtables in the social summit. So roundtable one on strengthening three pillars of social development, poverty eradication, and full and productive employment and decent work for all. And then roundtable two, which talks about assessing progress and addressing gaps and challenges in it, um, including implementation of the Copenhagen Declaration on social development, et cetera, et cetera. So it is fair to assume that a lot of the sub-thematics or the areas of focus would be built across the two roundtables that we are seeing. And in fact, if you were at the social um, summit strategy meeting yesterday, which my colleague Samia was moderating, we actually had breakouts and presenters on each of these different topics. Um, the social summit will have an outcome declaration, a political declaration, which will be negotiated in New York um, it, in advance. So we hopefully expect that is scheduled to come out soon. I think um, it is important to highlight that there are multiple networks that are involved when it comes to civil society engagement. We of course, have the major groups and the stakeholders, which actually have a number of thematic major groups and constituencies that follow a lot of these processes, whether that's decent work, whether that's um, uh, you know social inclusion, gender, youth, all of these things. Um, of course, NGOC SOGDI, which is the youth, uh, sorry, the, the Meca civil society mechanism to the Commission on Social Development, uh, which is ending its mandate with the next session, is um, an important partner. And then we've also seen a number of coalitions, so the Coalition on uh, Social Development um, and some other partners that were involved in the session yesterday. NDC Y and GCAP initiated a process in May this year at the UN Civil Society Conference um, to sort of convene different stakeholders and uh, coalitions that are working on this, and which is sort of now an open working group of various partners that are involved, including a A4SD, including many others that are in the room that have been working on this, aging stakeholder group and others. Um, and it is worth pointing out that resolution does mention different types of stakeholder groups like academia, private sector, children and youth, indigenous people, etc. However, it mentions that that they should be involved in the delegations of member states, which is kind of off. Like we have not seen a language like this, like they are the major groups on their own. You can't tell them that they should, you know, go and come as part of the government because then you're giving the authority to the government to sort of pick and choose who they should be. Maybe it works in a few Western countries where they have, you know, a great setup of how civil society is engaged. It does not work in most of the other countries. So the question begins, how do we make sure that rights holder communities are engaged in the social summit process, which is going to be a bit of a challenge because they'll always point back to saying, oh, the resolution says blah, blah, blah. So I think these are some things that we need to, you know, start thinking about. Um, so I think those are some uh, points I had. And then just to reflect on this from a perspective of, from the youth perspective, right? We are, of course, thinking of, do we want to do some sort of uh, pre-assemblies or consultations just like for Summit of the Future? Uh, do we want to do a youth assembly in Qatar? I think my colleague talked about it yesterday, um, but I'm not too sure how much outcome we are generating out of a youth forum in Qatar. I can already tell you that the youth forum next year, the ECOSOC youth forum in April, will be again three days long. Uh, most likely it's not officially confirmed yet, and with the third day focused on social summit, FFD, and sort of the key processes of next year. Um, having said that, I think it is worth brainstorming in the next session that we have where we talk about um, what are the action plan to think about this in detail, like what are we planning to do and to think of this in a more holistic format. Um, and highlighting, you know, that some of these discussion and discourses have to be like by rights holder themselves. We have seen a lot of uh, presence of New York and DC based foundations and think tanks in the process of summit of the future. Of course, they have a great role when it comes to influencing, for example, the US government, because you know, they are 
uh, based here and they have a lot of resources on that. But I really think that it's important that perspectives of rights holders are mainstream directly and not channeled through these, you know, foundations or space created um, by them, including, you know, foundations at the UN and others. So, um, and the voices that are there cannot be missing. They have to be built from what we have been able to achieve on the ground in our community, in our constituency, and in here in spaces such as um, GPA. And so to make sure that the social development is not just an abstract content, uh, concept, that it's about what it is, health, gender, education, rights, and um, poverty eradication. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jörg Gartner, um, for this really very good overview. Um, so I hope many people will <laughs> engage um, in this process. Um, so as uh, Jörg Gartner said, there are others uh, involved in this process, of course. Um, so I would like to ask Sylvia Billis from the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors and also from GCAP to add uh, on the World Social Summit. Wheels. Wheels. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, great. To follow you, Gratner, is always hard, but I'll have a go. Um, and uh, I think the main thing is that we have to work very closely together across all constituencies to make any kind of difference because uh, the World Social Summit or Social Summit for, I don't know what it was called in C Copenhagen, was very significant because it was about people-centered development, not economic, but people. And it made a terrific change uh, and we see its results in the, uh, you know, the frameworks and con conventions that followed. So we have to remember this is not, um, I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just trying to get hold of some material that I wanted to share. Uh, we, we, we have to remember that it is, it is different to the, uh, it, well, it should be different to the conventions that we're seeing, you know, the, the summit of the future and so on, because it's supposed to put people at the center again and review what happened, what has happened. So if those of you who are at the room in the room yesterday, we heard a very good uh, sort of review from Barbara Adams, who was um, at Copenhagen, as I'm sure many of you were, about what this means in practice. And there are certain principles which Copenhagen put in place about solidarity, about universalism, uh, about uh, the social development rights, requirements that we all need to have from cradle to the grave to live in dignity and respect and in peace. So it's very important that we work together as we go forward. So I would like to, uh, I mean, I've been involved in two great meetings here. Uh, one just passed on intergenerational collaboration and the other one on the um, social summit. From the perspective of the global coalition of social protection flaws, which is trying to, uh, you know, insist that the commitments of governments to deliver universal social protection in every single country, which means ring fencing funding, it means going from the bottom up, it means working with communities about what works best. You know, they are not fulfilling this promise and that's just one area. So the floor covers uh, health and income, but what about education? What about housing? What about transport? What about uh, participation in local governance? You know, these are all relevant for Copenhagen plus 25. And we in the coalition had some conversations with DESA uh, in uh, when, whenever it was, when was it, Ingo, June. Uh, and we're in touch with the team of DESA about how we go forward. And what they really want is uh, policy ideas I suggest we think together right now in convening a group. We've got a little WhatsApp group going from yesterday. So 
those of you who want to be in that WhatsApp group, please tell me or you, Gretna, and we'll make sure you're in it. Uh, we have to work out what to do. And I so uh, I think we need to probably, this is just, we haven't talked about it properly yet, but I think we need to decide on a number of substantive policy briefs which we agree to provide to DESA. We need to uh, think politically because there's a phrase in the modalities resolution which states very clearly that people will be allowed to go to the conference if the PGA agrees it. So we've got to sort that out. Uh, we've got to have a funding stream to get people to the conference, but we've also got to meet before. And what would be very useful, uh, those in the room who follow the, the Commission for Social Development, where where the modalities and so on of follow-up will be cited, we should uh, think to meet and strategize together, but also to meet with the governments at the Commission in February because it'll be much easier to meet governments and say in this summit, and it will be easy for us to work together. And I know that the NGO uh, Committee for Social Development based here is thinking about that. So I would, I think there are a number of points of communication and contact, but it's also important that we properly share our expertise and our practice and our voice, because Copenhagen, in 95 was a moment where people from all over the world, from all over communities, did their best to raise their voice. And Qatar is going to be quite hard to get to, to raise our voices. And there are some ideas about getting some funding together for that, but who knows? If we can't do it uh, there, we'll have to do it not there, but we'll have to do it anyway. And we need to do it through the different conferences. FFD, we talked about yesterday in the fishbowl about what is a feminist financing. We need to get that into the World Social Summit. So uh, I think that's all I would say. Principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. So um, I really like this um, cooperation from those who have been in Copenhagen 1995, also with the young people and of course all. So I think that's fitting very to the session we had before um, and that makes um, a lot of strength. So we have heard from the different summits, uh, Beijing Plus 30, FFD4, um, also World Social Summit. Um, one other very important is of course uh, the Climate COP. Um, we're not talking about the Biodiversity COP uh, which is happening in October this year, but uh, um, we can also not cover everything in this session, um, but uh, I'm happy that uh, Mitika is here, Mitika Wender uh, from the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, Paksha. Let me just uh, say that Mitika was just uh, included in the Climate 100 list of the independent, um, a list of um, uh, um, people who are most influential on the climate. Um, Side, uh, congratulations. That's uh, um, if if I, I went through the list. Uh, I mean, they're they're nice people, but they also I, I don't. I was a bit surprised about some people. Uh, let's say, but I'm. I think it was. I was really happy to see see you on this list. So um, that's good. <laughs> Can you come here um, and talk about um, COPs? Um, yeah, our topic is 2025, so that's a COP in Brazil. But uh, maybe you can cover also the COP in uh, Azerbaijan. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope I'm one of the good people, not the bad people you found there. <laughs> so thank you very much, um, Ingo. And uh, first, again, let me take this opportunity to really uh, applaud you and the team which has really been organizing this, because this is the kind of organizing which we need uh, to uh, be able to overcome the challenges which we face at the world. Uh, I think one of the things is, uh, and which will be repeated here, is um, the issue how are we connected, you know, interconnectedness of the society. The ones who are 
working on climate action, the one who are working on tax justice, the debts, the food security, the young people, and all these things, because all are connected. The emphasis then here is how does each event, each process build into each other? And for us, in the climate justice movement, we are not looking into actually into the COP29. We are looking into to the build up, building the momentum up to Belém, up to COP30. And within that, then we ask ourselves, what are other top of us? What are other key moments which are connected with this? No, no, you, 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 it's it, it, no need of connecting. Uh, and so, uh, when you look at um, at the issues which are at hand, is that, and everybody during our present our 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 session here, we were talking about the the five trillion US dollars. Of course, there is no statistics about or the, 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 there is no basis of that, but we believe that that is what we need. There is a study which has done to be released of what we require every year on to address climate action, whether it's adaptation, mitigation, just transition. And so, for us, we are looking into working with other movements. After COP29, and we believe that uh, this is just the meeting we are doing here. It's not just a part, uh, an event, and just isolated event. It's a build-up which we started in the during the UN Civil Society Conference in Nairobi, building into the UN the soft, building from there COP twenty nine. How does it build to World Social Summit? How does it build to FFD4 in Spain? And so by that time, we will have built so much a big momentum really to address the interconnected issues we have in the society. And so when we look then into that, for the issue on climate, we are facing a crisis. But a crisis which is being forgotten rapidly, for instance. The sixth assessment report of IPCC was released in March 2023, and clearly we are not going to be able to achieve 1.5 degrees centigrade. Everybody knows about the science. But we have defined some scientific advice and continued with our carbon addiction through continued and sustainable modes of con production and consumption, which have made us reach where we are now. And so, what do we do in terms of this? Where do we go in, uh, uh, out of that? I know we, we have so many pressure groups, so many movements across the world, but they are operating in isolation, in silo way of doing things. The question is, who is going to connect us? I met a gentleman who is supposed to be the chair of the civil society movement uh, towards the World Social Summit. He is, uh, he is the one who is going to be chairing the civil society. I was asking him, uh, I'm seated here and he is uh, on the other big building. So he was saying, he is pursuing governments and those. But I told him, this is the place you should be because this is where you are going to get allies which are going to help you in achieving and building a, a big civil society presence in that. And this is now the biggest challenge we have. So are we going to rely on the, the, the Global People's Assembly? And how strong is it going to be? How inclusive it is going to be? How are we going to generate that critical mass of change? How are we going to inspire a bottom-up, you know, from below kind of mobilization by the time we reach here 
what numbers do we need for instance here as compared to the opposite building these are some of the questions which we need to ask ourselves as we go into now mobilization and building on what we are doing how is my work building on what is doing in brussels how is my, our work in Africa connecting with our counterparts in Asia and particularly Latin America who are going to be anchoring us, the movements, in that as we move towards now Belém? Because we want that. You know Belém is very symbolic. In 1992, that is when, you know, all these conventions during the Rio, for those who are older, who, who may be, most of us may not have been there. But it is very important to notice that uh, from all those years, really, what have we achieved? Could we make that a moment of reflection now that we are going back to Brazil, to Rio? But of course, Belém is going to be very near there. How are we going to be prepared towards that with the, all those movements? And uh, who, will, who is going to be connecting us? I believe by the time we live here, that strategy is there. I have been invited to a number of meetings from some in very isolated, but of st of still making efforts. How do we bring those efforts together? I have participated since I came here in three meetings of allies who are just thinking about Belém. But you know, they are doing it differently. I was asking them, how are we connected? So these are very fundamental issues. Do we want to change things? Do we need transformation? How are we going to achieve this? I believe we need to relate deep conversation about this because that is what worries us in Africa. We are so divided and the challenges ahead of us do not require us to be divided, to work in silos. I know somebody yesterday mentioned that uh, we are different. We are not saying that we should agree on everything, but there are issues which need to connect us so that we confront the adversaries. I never call them enemies because we also, they are just adversaries. They disagree with us, but we need to bring them. How are we going to make ourselves attractive so that we can work with them? So here, uh, my friend um, uh, Ingo, I'm not, you can hear, I'm not talking so much about science because all of us about, know about science. We, all of us have interacted with the literature. We know what we need. What we don't have is how do we reach there? And that is the question really which we have really been confronting. And the answer to that question is working together. That is very important. We want to really to work with movements all over the world. We want to build the North-South collaboration. But practically, we need to be pragmatic that it is easier seen than done. That's the biggest challenge we have. So for us, the issue of climate justice, and this is what has happened in the, in the all, is, is only addressing how do we slow climate change by reducing the greenhouse gases. That's the most important thing. So whatever language, semantics people use is about mitigation. That is, people talk about face out, face down, equitable fossil fuel uh, 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 reduction, but it is about mitigation actions. The other one is because you are living with this problem is how do we adapt? but also in an equitable manner. So when we talk about the issues of just transition, what does it mean in the low carbon climate resilient development pathways? Which pathways? Of course, the world we have was destroyed due to unsustainable modes of production and consumption. Do we, even if we are in the North, even if, of course, we blame the North of the problem which has caused this problem. But we ask ourselves, do we want to continue with that mode of consumption, uh, production and consumption, burning fossil fuels? But if we want, like us in a poor country, in our developing countries, in African countries, our leaders are just talking about 
really, we want to exploit our oil. The North is saying to keep us oil on the ground and cool on the oil because they developed, they don't want us to develop. It is an economic issue. And so, how are we going to ensure that we convince them it is no longer sustainable? Constructive engagement. And that's why in Africa we have this, that debate on potentially stranded assets. We need really to convince our leaders. I was reading when I was coming an, 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 an economist uh, uh, the, the magazine. And China, as we speak now, China in the last year has sold more cars. I think the 51% of the cars which they have sold are electric cars. Go to, to, to Norway. Majority of the cars there are electric cars. What does that tell, that tell you the future which we are going? It is inevitable. Whether you want to transition or not, the transition is inevitable. But how are we going to do it? What conversations do we have? These are very important issues. And for us then is recognition that climate change and climate discourse process has been overshadowed by other very important, very serious challenges and the crisis in the world. For instance, right now, even if there are resources going to look to go into, into the climate action, most of the government, northern governments are telling you our money is going into, uh, into the Israeli war, in Israeli and the Gaza war, or Ukraine. Just the other day, when in COP28, we had the pledging of, uh, of the, the pledge on loss and damage they were able to garner only 700 million US dollars. But three months later, the US Senate alone passed a budget just for killing people for war in Gaza and Ukraine. 95 billion US dollars. So the issue is not about the, 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 there is no money. It is, where is that money? They rather give that money, billions of, of dollars, to buy w w for weapons, to buy bombs and those others, rather than put it in, in, into a climate action. These are the hypocrisies, contradictions which we have. How do we ensure that we direct resources and ensure that we use the platforms which are existing to really ensure that uh, we, we support climate action and we provide resources for climate action and other crises, biodiversity loss, pollution, and those others, which they are turning their, 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 their hands because for them, it is not urgent. Let me end it there. And uh, I, I think for us in the climate movement, we are very committed to this source, uh, to this cause. The only thing is the worry as a person which I have is that we need really to sort ourselves out before we go out. And I think during the strategy, we are going to, to input into where we need to go into that roadmap. We need a roadmap which goes beyond even 20 that because we cannot cheat ourselves that we are going to solve this problem even by 20, by, by, by COP30. It is not possible. It is complex. There is resistance, but we have to win the adversaries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mitika. I think you made a really strong case um, for this cooperation um, for working together, and and that will be actually what you described the core of the of the afternoon. Um, so, and let me say at this point, for you as Paksha were really very supportive for this Global People's Assembly, also. Uh, I will mention also um, others later, but uh, also to support really not politically, but also financially. Baksha is actually the biggest supporter among all the uh, co-organizers. And uh, I, I think this is a real political um, um, strategy. Um, and uh, I really um, appreciate that. And um, I think that that is really important for the whole Global People's Assembly. So thank you for that. Um, so um, we have uh, one last speaker um, before we come to the to the lunch. <laughs> so 
yeah i know we the the the, ch the problem is it's always this first day of the glo high level week when uh, biden speaks uh, security is a, is a problem then therefore we started i think uh, about ha half an hour late uh, in the morning and therefore we are a bit late in the in the program i'm i'm sorry for that but i maybe hand um, uh, hand ali navi from the humanitarian, humanitarian tracker she uh, if you can um, try to make it short um, Um, I'm going to say one quick word and end you with the video, but if you want to take a quick stretch break, I will be very quick, but can you stand up and just stretch so that I don't see sleepy faces? <laughs> so while you do that, I will tell you, my name is Hend al Hinawi. I'm the executive director of an organization called Humanitarian Tracker. We do crowdsourcing and AI for social good. We've been doing it for 14 years. Um, the gentleman behind me mentioned something very important. He said, how can we know about each other, connect? And in 2016, we were awarded a top 10 global innovation that could be applied to the sustainable development goals and featured right here. So I came and I met so many people like you that were doing amazing projects, ran amazing organizations, but then we didn't know about each other. And so that's how the Global Action Mosaic was born. You'll see these posters. The Global Action Mosaic is crowdsourcing and visualizing what people are doing, what organizations are doing around the world to make the SDGs our reality. So you share your project and you become part of our global network, but we don't stop there. The point is we want you to know about each other. We also want to use the data to inform policy, to show what's happening and to derive insights. So our platform was used in the UN Civil Society Conference and during the at the end, we presented some very important statistics, including that 52% of the projects that were mapped came from the global south. And this is very important because not everybody was able to be there, but their voice was still heard because they were still able to share what they were doing. And so that's a very key important, very key part of why this is so important. We want to be part of the mosaic. So I will end there. I have stickers in the back. So please scan this QR code, be a part of our coalition. We are very active in all things UNGA and beyond. And I also have stickers in the back. Uh, you can take it, scan the QR code and share what you're doing. And I will have a short video. I also have chocolate at the end. We are based in Seattle and I have Seattle chocolates and I have I know it's been a tiring week, so I always bring my Korean face mask. So if you would like a face mask, come on up and get one. Refresh. And thank you for your attention before lunch. okay thank you so uh we are almost there <laughs> i know you're hungry so i would like to ask uh harrison just to come here not to speak actually <laughs> just uh because i i know you work on the biodiversity cop uh, like others so just to mention it without explaining it can you just yeah, say one one sentence about the biodiversity COP. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Harrison from Cameroon. Actually, uh, this year we know uh, the COP of 20, uh, 2022, which was COP 15, was based on developing the biodiversity, the global biodiversity framework. And in and in uh, in, in in Kenya, a few months back, the indicators for the implementation of this w were presented. And in this COP that we're going in Cali coming next month, we'll be looking at countries engaging in implementing this COP because they will be developing their NBSAP, that's their National Strategy for Biodiversity Development uh, Planning. So it is, we think that 
biodiversity is key. We have the, th the we have three main objectives for biodiversity, and the third one, which is talking about access to benefit sharing, and we're talking about bringing development to the people, bringing the, 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 all the big money that they are pronouncing to bring it down to the people. And we think access to genetic resources, access to benefit sharing can get this to the people and get the people active. So I see this as an opportunity for us. Thank you, Engo, again, but for an opportunity for all of us in this, in this forum to engage in this program and see that we protect our environment and our biodiversity. Thank you, Dr. Mwende, for, for, bringing, for linking the biodiversity and climate change. Thank you very much, uh, Harrison. I think I'm sure you have, you would have had much more to say. <laughs> so, but it's good that we at least could hear this. So uh, we have now the lunch break. Uh, so for half an hour, we have again Indian food, a uh, bit different. Um, then, um, yeah. So we have the break for half an hour, and afterwards we start with the planning, the mobilization planning session uh, for next year. Thank you. Actually, I don't have my class uh, at the moment. Uh, to Can you go to the GK website? Find there.